Katie, are you still with us? Dr. Osias, I'm waiting. Or Actually, you went out, you went out for, for hiking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, what an outstanding lecture. Thank you very much, Katie, for this informative lecture. And we are going to start taking questions. Um, I have a question for you. It's not about the lecture. It's something else that is really interesting for me. So when you look, when anyone look you up on Twitter, you're not Katie Fowler. Your chemical shift. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, well, you know, it kind of goes back to the MR background. Um, but you can find me by my real name, I think. I know, I know we can find you, but it was very interesting for me to see your handle as chem shift, chemical shift. So this is how much you love MR, right? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> you know, um, I'll maybe embarrass Dr. Serlin here for a moment. He actually, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, well, Dr. Cherniak is the one who got me into Twitter. I'm kind of a social media, I don't know, shy person, I guess. And we were at the SAR. I think we were in maybe Arizona, sitting around a beautiful fire at night, enjoying some drinks. And she said, you have to join Twitter. It's you know very important for career development, networking, et cetera. Um, so I'm very glad I did. Uh, so thank you, Victoria, for that advice. And then Claude asked me, you know, well, what is, what's your Twitter handle? And I told him and he says, wait, no, you can't use that. So <laughs> why can I use that? I said, well, you're not, you're not like nerdy enough for that. <laughs> he said, <laughs> Take offense to that, Claude. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think you're more advanced than Claude. Claude even doesn't have uh, like uh, uh, like a Twitter account, or he even has like a very beginner Twitter account. Like uh, Claude, have... someone someone of Claude's caliber should have like thousands of followers. But I don't think he takes care of his Twitter account. Yeah. Um, so uh, questions. Uh, the first two questions actually is from Doctor. El diasty, like when you hear El diasty, you get really nervous because uh, Dr. Tarek El diasty is a very popular name in uh, Egypt, and he is the president of Af African Society of Radiology, and has been the president of Egyptian Society of Radiology for many years, and he is be being very active, but mainly in Europe. And uh, I'm going to introduce Mohammed. That's not Dr. El diasty who's asking the question. Mohammed is his son, and he's a young guy young radiologist practicing, I think, in Jeddah now. So, Muhammad, can you please uh, ask the question you have? Okay, thank you, Dr. Khaled. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fowler, for the great lecture. Actually, after the lecture, I had three questions. The two I previously sent to Dr. Khaled. Uh, so, I will start with the one regarding uh, the Irad M uh, lesions or observations. Uh, do you think that there is a role for um, uh, tumor markers in the separation uh, of HCC and cholangiocarcinoma in uh, the red uh, in features? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's actually, you know, um, some ongoing research to look at this. Currently, LIRADS does not incorporate tumor markers into their diagnostic algorithm, but I think that as evidence accumulates of how to combine the tumor marker with the features, it can be very useful. Uh, some work that we've done looked at tumor markers in the setting of uh, combined tumors. And what we found was that if you had a lesion that looked like an HCC, so if you have an LR5, but you had an elevated CA199, that was potentially an indication that you're dealing with a combined tumor. Or vice versa, if you have a lesion that looks LRM, but a lot, a uh, very high AFP, that can also give you a clue um, that you're dealing with a lesion that may be sort of a biphenotypic. Uh, so really that discordance in tumor markers between uh, the marker serologically and the imaging appearance. So yeah, we, in 2018, uh, and now currently in 2020, we don't incorporate them into the LIRADS algorithm, but I will tell you that in practice, they can be very helpful. And I would anticipate that as evidence accumulates that these, these may find their way into the algorithm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my second question is that regarding uh, LIRAD5 uh, category, uh, on almost the recent reports, uh, the specificity for uh, LIRAD5 category didn't reach uh, 100% yet. There's still a range of error. Uh, 
so what's your explanation for this range of errors and uh, what are the strategies that will be implemented in the future versions of LIRATS? Yeah, so while we strive for perfection, uh, you know, the reality is we're probably never going to get it. Um, so we don't say 100%, we say 95% because it's pretty darn close to 100. But, you know, the user errors, um, Dr. Khaled has a great talk, I think, coming up about some of the pitfalls. Um, you know, so I think there are some, some user errors in terms of applying the criteria. One of, um, one of my pet peeves is this concept of unequivocal, right? So we throw around, well, you're unequivocally gonna say that there's washout and arterial phase hyperenhancement, but what does unequivocal actually mean? Uh, when, you know, you go to tumor board and your colleague overreads you. Uh, so how can that be unequivocal? Well, unequivocal, I think, means that you, a hundred times out of a hundred would call it. So it's more of a measure of uh, intra-reader agreement than inter-reader agreement. So I think one of the issues that you come into is that you can be swayed uh, by wanting to make that diagnosis. So you've got a patient who's potentially a transplant candidate and there's a lesion or an observation in the liver and you know your surgeons and your hepatologists really want you to call that an HCC. So you might say, well, um, yeah, I guess, I guess there's some arterial phase hyper enhancement. Okay. And yeah, okay, if I window it really hard, okay, yeah, now I see some washout. Uh, so I think there's always going to be, you know, a, a little bit of sort of the application where, where you're going to have potentially some errors related to that. Um, but I guess one way we can address that in future versions is to more objectively define some of these criteria. Uh, as you heard Dr. Cherniak talk yesterday, Currently, all of the criteria that we use are subjective, qualitative uh, criteria. So perhaps in the future, we'll move towards more um, objective criteria as the evidence accumulates that allows us to incorporate them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Thank you very much, Mohammed. And say, so I'll say hi to Dr. Tarek, please. Sure, um, thank you. So next uh, question is with Dr. Sandeep. Sandeep, can you talk? Can you ask the question you have? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Sandeep. So where are you from, Sandeep? Uh, I'm from India. Great, great. Which city in India? Um, I'm working in Delhi. Oh, uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks great. a ton great. for a very nice lecture. Uh, I had a small doubt that do you routinely biopsy all lesions which are LRM and are resectable? On imaging great question yeah so that gets at uh, a concept that i did not cover today and that is the management of lrm uh, probably i should have added a couple slides on that but yeah so the management and what you do about these lesions is going to depend on where you're practicing and what sorts of um, treatments are available to your patients in the united states in the patients we typically uh, are reading imaging on they're often uh, cirrhotic. Uh, many of them have portal hypertension. In fact, very few of our patients are candidates for resection. So those who are not candidates for resection, we will tend to get a biopsy if there's an LRM. Alternatively, we could try, um, uh, you know, sometimes we use CEUS as a problem-solving modality, but it gets a bit complicated with the management. But most times, yeah, if you think you're dealing with a non-HCC malignancy, if the patient is a resection candidate, I agree, there's really no need to need to biopsy if they're going to have the, the tumor resected anyway. Uh, you could just sort it out at the hepatectomy. Uh, but if they're not a resection candidate, then most times if they are um, a transplant candidate, you're going to have to establish that diagnosis. If they're not a transplant candidate and you're thinking about local regional therapy versus systemic, you're oftentimes still going to want a diagnosis to help direct your management plan. So yeah, right. very good question. In, in other parts of the world, uh, hepatectomy tends to be used more frequently because oftentimes the patients, if they have hepatitis B, uh, are not necessarily cirrhotic. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Alhamami. Dr. Alhamami has a question. Can you uh, speak? You can unmute and speak if you wish. Okay, let me ask you this question on your behalf. 
So thank you so much for the presenter, Dr. Fowler, and for the organizing committee for sharing this great lectures. My question is, and I'm just, um, you know, just saying exactly what Dr. Hamami is writing. In case I have an emergency case came in my own call, and incidentally, I found a cirrhotic liver with a lesion, and we don't have any data regarding this situation or his situation, does cirrhosis related to viral etiology or something else? So, shall we apply? He says by reds, but I think like reds. He, he show, uh, shall we apply like reds or not? Okay, yeah, that's a good question too. So that question gets at um, what if you don't know if the patient meets this LIRADS criteria, right? I've warned you against applying LIRADS in the non-LIRADS population. So how do you not make that mistake? Well, if you see uh, clear-cut evidence of cirrhosis by imaging, um, no, I don't have time to go into all the details of, of that, but if you see clear-cut cirrhosis by imaging, typically I will then apply LIRADS in that case. If I am provided with a history from the clinician that they have underlying cirrhosis, because we know that the imaging diagnosis can be insensitive, uh, I will apply LIRADS. Now, how about those instances where the imaging findings are not clear cut? So maybe you perceive a little nodularity or you know widening of the preportal space, but you're not provided any history of cirrhosis from the clinician. In those cases, you may still apply LIRADS but you might do it in a provisional sense. So you might say, if this patient is found to have sufficient at-risk criteria, or, or is found to be cirrhotic, or is found to meet the LIRADS population, then this lesion in you know, segment eight of the liver would meet criteria for LR5. So you provide a provisional LIRADS category, and you sort of uh, put the the burden uh, or the responsibility on the clinician then for determining that patient's risk status. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fowler. So Dr. Uh, Harish from Jefferson. Harish, can you please speak uh, your question? Yeah. Hey, Dr. Fowler, uh, great lecture. Um, just a quick question. Uh, in terms of uh, when you have a LIRADS M lesion, if there's ancillary features that do suggest that it's HCC, and you, you kind of had some examples in your lecture uh, with hemorrhage or fat, can you, is there any research that's been done to say like, oh, this is LIRADS M, but favorite HCC, and would that be a reasonable thing to state in a dictation? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, there is some research going on uh, currently. I know of a multi-center study that's looking into this, that the results are not published yet. Uh, and, you know, early on when we were coming up with these LIRADS criteria, we were trying to decide, you know, what should the LIRADS criteria be for LRM? And, you know, we had initially kind of a complex algorithm that included things like fat in the mass or uh, blood products. And, you know, it had arrows going in two different directions, you know, if this, then HCC, uh, if that, then uh, non-HCC. We found that it just became a little bit complex. And, and we're constantly hearing from all of you guys as users that LIRADS needs to be made more simple. <laughs> so we, we opted for our current situation, which is the targetoid features and the non-targetoid features. But we all recognize that a mass that has rim affy because it has central fat or because it has central blood products is probably more likely to be an HCC. So this is kind of a, a systematic pitfall, uh, one that LIRADS may uh, change in the future. But yeah, so the way that I address it is exactly as you said. I would call this an LRM because by stringent LIRADS criteria, it would be an LRM. But I may say in the dictation, uh, given the presence of blood products or given the presence of fat in mass, this is likely an HCC, uh, an atypical HCC, if you will. So yeah, that's something that hopefully we'll address in the future. Uh, maybe with the results of this multi-center study, we can make changes to the algorithm. Okay, great, thanks. Great question and outstanding answer. Dr. Kassam Zahra, 
Kassam from London, Ontario. I actually tried to bug her to talk, but she's having uh, piano lessons right now for her daughters. So she doesn't want to be distracting to you, Katie. So <laughs> she's asking to ask her a question on her behalf. She's saying, thanks for the great talk. How important is the 20 minutes delayed hepatobiliary phase to judge LRM? Is 10 or 15 minutes sufficient? Yeah, so great question. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, so we tend to get the 20 minute, but as I mentioned, sometimes this hepatobiliary phase targetoid appearance can be transient and only really seen on those earlier phases. This comes uh, from the literature, mostly from Asia, and these were patients that were not child P, you know, C. So it's a bit of a balance. Uh, if we, you know, get the 10 or 15 minute in some of our cirrhotic patients, we may not have uh, an optimal hepatobiliary phase at that point to assess. Uh, so we do tend to, as a default, get that 20 minute. Um, but clearly from a protocol perspective and an efficiency model, you know, doing an earlier hepatobiliary phase and then quitting at 15 minutes would be more optimal. So yeah, I unfortunately don't know the answer for the efficiency um, of doing a 15 versus a 20 in the cirrhotic population, uh, but I think it'd be a great research project if anyone wants to take that on. Thank you very much, uh, Zahra and Katie. Uh, we have Reem Al-Bahrani. Reem, do you wanna ask, please? You wanna speak? Reem? Okay. Uh, so her question is, should all infiltrative lesions be assigned an LRM category even they demonstrate typical arterial enhancement and washout? Very good question. Yeah, so that's a point that I tried to make in the talk and that is that those non-targetoid features only apply to lesions that do not meet LR5 or TIV criteria. So if you have an infiltrative mass that demonstrates AFI and washout, that would be an LR5. So great, great. Well, Katie, um, I think, uh, I mean, there is another question and I think this is to me how to find the link for tomorrow lecture, sir. My email is whatever. Okay, appreciate sending. What happened is like, those are all personal efforts. So it's not the best planning and organization. We're doing it based on just personal efforts. And now I realize how difficult it is because uh, there are many logistics <clears throat> that need administrative person people to take care of, like sending mass emails. And some people are, are missing. I mean, I don't know what exactly to do. I mean, we're trying to send to everyone, and but we actually get an email back that 5% didn't get the, uh, the email. And we have no way, hopefully we'll improve, but thanks for sending your email. I'm copying it and I'll try to hopefully um, send it to you uh, personally. And uh, again, thank you very, very much, Dr. Uh, Katie Fowler. We really appreciate this great talk and thanks everyone who came from all over the world to attend this lecture. And uh, uh, we hope we are hoping to continue uh, our lectures. That are, there will be other great series that I'm actually planning for and for, be, uh, for different levels because I'm so inspired by uh, your interest and um, you're being very eager to uh, to learn and exchange knowledge. So uh, I'm doing a series for uh, basics of radiology. I'm gonna start this this soon. And uh, there will be something that I wanna plan with my colleagues about World Cup, where I get someone from each continent to actually uh, volunteer to compete with other people. And we have World Cup and we'll see who's the winner for interesting, difficult cases. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, Kidar. You know, it's those people always um, people always thank the speaker. Last time, Kidar said thanks to the speaker. I told him only to the speaker, and he said, uh, "No, now today he's saying thanks, Khaled. Excellent talks." 
So that's the first one to thank me personally. So yeah. anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Let me just point something out to everyone else. Um, Khaled is working. You know, this is not his primary job. So I don't know how you're doing it, Khaled, how you're reading radiology, doing everything else you have to do, and this on top of it. It is a ton of work. And uh, thank you very much for putting it together. And I think everyone appreciates all of your efforts. I really appreciate that. But I think uh, the great pleasure of just seeing people are really uh, learning and appreciating that this is a great, the great um, gain for me and for all of you. And thank you very much for volunteering. I mean, without you would not have been uh, like in this uh, successful uh, uh, webinar with, with our colleagues all over the world. I'm also inspired of having everyone from all over the world together. We are one, we are united. We're one, the humans are one against one enemy, which is evil and viruses and illness. So let's let's stay united. And thank you very much, Katie, for, for putting, putting this together and for other also colleagues who uh, are volunteering to uh, participate, appreciate it. And um, with that, I will end our session tomorrow. Federica and Roberto from Italy will have a great company with Dr. Forlan. So stay tuned till tomorrow and I will try to send the link again. Appreciate it, everyone. Thank you very much.